Well, Nancy, I've known John 35 years. 35 years ago, I was too young to drink, drive, wear long pants, or smoke. But I've known John out of that 35 years. I've known him 22 of the 35 he's been with IBM. John's very first assignment was the only assignment that he was ever on with me that he failed in. It was an assignment to keep me out of trouble. It was given to him by Jack Bertram, and I don't know that it's ever been canceled. Now, for people who don't know John very well, when John was younger, John was a terrific carouser, or carouser based on how you pronounce it, and a terrific skier. Some of the ski incidents that occurred with John are probably of, of worthwhile note. John, many, many years ago, had decided it was very important that he and I spend some time together working on the design of a machine which predated the 801, but was a one-board, single-cycle machine called Service Free. And came into our house one night, quite late, where we had a dinner guest. Instructed the dinner guest to leave, told Marianne that in order to work we were going to have to go away and instructed her to pack for a ski trip to Vermont. This was 11 o'clock at night. We packed John's car, packed Marianne and the dog in the back seat of the car and drove on up to Vermont working on the design all the way up with Marianne using the dog as a blanket in the back. This was a German Shepherd. When we got there, we did a typical normal thing. We went to sleep mid-sentence. And a few hours later when we woke up, we drove my wife crazy by picking up in the middle of the sentence we were on. Nancy, there's another friend of John's who won't be with us today but wanted to send his greetings, a uh, fellow venture capitalist out here who used to work at Intel named Bill Davidow. And he reminded me of another skiing story that was of some interest. John had picked he and his wife up in Palo Alto and was discussing a great idea he had. In fact, he discussed it from Palo Alto all the way to Tahoe as one sentence without any period until arriving in Tahoe. To this day, Bill never told John that the reservations they had were at Bear, at, at Bear not at uh, Tahoe. John had a problem when he skied. Uh, John never could get jackets and sweaters quite long enough. And John, as you know, is a terrific skier. He aimed downhill, closed his eyes, and would ski like crazy. Not well, but fast. But his problem was every time he leaned over, his short jackets and short sweaters were always a few inches above his trousers, his ski pants. Well, there's a new study that's been undertaken at his favorite university. As you know, John contributes heavily to Duke, and Duke has tremendous medical research going on. They are now researching the entire science of the cure of gaposis. Of all the years I've known John, I have never gone into a bar anywhere in the counterminious United States where the bartender didn't know John. In fact, I thought I'd found a real find a few weeks ago when I was at a suburb of uh, Chicago called Lincolnshire. When I walked into a bar and met a young bartender, and the first thing I asked him naturally is, do you know my friend John Cock? And he said, no, but let me check on something. Called his father in, his father knew you, John. His father knew John and, and just ruined this, this search I've been on, the quest for the first bartender who didn't know John. Okay, hold on a second. You know, John and I used to pal around at a lot of bars together, and one of the things we do going into closing time at a bar was have to have a place to deposit our ideas. There are a number of bars throughout California and Midwest, New York, at various ski resorts that have the data flow of many of the ideas we worked on engraved into bars. In fact, I suspect that if IBM wanted to recapture all of the data, which is now, I guess, probably considered public domain if it's engraved in a bar, they would have to buy a significant number of bar tops. John had another habit, and that was John liked to mix drinks. Um, after, you know, having a case or so of beer he liked to mix drinks. And in his younger days was quite an acrobat. In fact, John was what was called a beam walker. Uh, I understand now that the Bluetooth has installed safety nets, John, so if you want to try it again, they're ready for you. He um, used to climb out on these rafters. 
and walk across for free drinks. Well, it's been 20, 22 some odd years since I first met John. It's I always been fun. I met him in an interview with Jack Bertram where Jack was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with me. And John was there and that was when he took on this job of keeping me out of trouble. Now there was a, an interesting thing that happened. John and I used to, to like to do work together and do things together. But every once in a while we would get very involved in what we were doing and sometimes disappear. I would like to know if there's still a prohibition on John and I traveling unchaperoned in, in California. I mean, there was a period of time where Bertram had put this order out that the two of us must be accompanied whenever we left the lab together. It's been it's been a good good time. We've done a lot of things together, and uh, I'll never I'll never forget all of the uh, the fun we've had, and it's always been fun. Service Free was the very first project. That was in 1968. It was a kind of a precursor to the 801. It was a single cycle, one board machine. Uh, we worked with a number of the people out of ACS on it. Uh, ACS was just winding down. Uh, in fact, John was still doing some things for ACS and, and Bertram had just come out and I spent some time with John's old crew. But we created a group out of the remnants of ACS to do this little one board super speed computer. I actually did just hear about that from uh, Frank Snow. He was part of that service group, right? Yes, Frank Snow was, um, John, Phil Dauber, Fred Bulow, who is uh, another old friend, Billy Mooney, Gene Trivet, um, Charlie Fryman, I think, worked on service free, Dave Hellman. Long list. When you think of John's work, what do you think of first? Two cigarettes hanging out of his mouth and two bent over in the ashtray with a quarter of an inch gun. Or, or a, uh, an ashtray full of chewing gum. Now I, I always think of, of the fun we had walking, talking, and creating. John never ever stopped creating. And we had a lot of fun because we could bounce more ideas as, as a team together than anyone could ever have implemented. And so working with John, you become more creative. You have, you have fun and you do things and you just, it's an idea generation cycle. It's a, it's a very, very great way to charge up and feel good. So I always think, I mean, that's the part of, of the work that I always remember with John, when you think about John. That and his cigarettes. Which, now given up. Which he has now given up. He assures me he has given them up. That's what Capek told me too. There were a lot of people who worked around John and I who didn't appreciate the fact that if we were at a bar at 2 o'clock and decided it was time to keep going, we'd call them up and visit them at 3. Um, I mean, there were numbers. I, I can remember one time when John was very angry about an announcement of a promotion of an individual from outside IBM into IBM. He'll remain unmentioned. And John came over to the house very upset. The bars had closed. He needed someone to talk to. It was about 2 or 2.30, so I stayed up with him drinking until 6 and then started making coffee so we could go into work together. <laughs> but <laughs> we made calls together. Used to call Bertram. Bertram, fortunately, was a guy who woke up very early, so if we stayed up real late, we could get Bertram early in the morning because he, he got up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. Most people, when they think about John, think about the 20-year the fight to bring risk into the major product line of IBM, and they view the 6000 and, and the work that was done on the 801 as a primary success. But there were a number of things that were as fundamental to the computing industry that John did that people tend to forget about. Most of the modern concepts of compiler technology were concepts that John was responsible for seeding throughout universities and IBM and although only recently have they come to fruition these were fundamental contributions that John made that will have as big an effect as risk will have. Uh, machine architectures not just the notions of uh, risk but fundamental notions today that we all accept. John was very much involved in, in the whole beginnings of look aside technologies for caching for translation and drove a lot of those technologies along with other people here in IBM but John had a very very major impact on it starting with with stretch 
So I think there were technically a very broad spectrum of things that John was involved with, and we tend to lose sight of them in terms of the thing which is most visible today. But the other success John had was one of making people, and making people better than they would be without him. He had a way of, of bringing out either the best or the worst in people. Um, and those he brought out the worst in probably suffered the consequences properly. Those he brought out the best in made major contributions themselves. It would not have occurred without John there prodding them and pushing them. Uh, I think those of us, all of us who've been around John, uh, are the better for it. And I think that's as important a contribution to the industry as the specific technologies. John managed it in a really simple way. John never outgrew his own childish curiosity. Uh, the curiosity you normally see in a very young child, not even an older child, he always marveled at and was always excited by things. And that excitement was contagious. And it's that contagion which helped. And, and the people who didn't catch it generally weren't worth having around discussions anyway. Oh, I think John's caring, John's absolute childlike curiosity that's never, never stopped burning in him. His, his sensitivity. John is one of the few people I know who would take the shirt off his back for anyone he thought who needed it. John's, John's curiosity but John, and John's whole lack of concern over the things that most people worry about. John and I shared an office in Yorktown for some period of time. And when he moved into his own office and we, you know, we separated, he actually moved to, to another office, I had to go through all the drawers to find the various checks and things that he'd left in the drawers, uncashed. Um, as he had done, by the way, when he left his office at ACS, he had cleaned it all up, stacked this pile, and left most of his salary checks and dividend checks and things in the office. John just doesn't worry about the things that other people worry about. And there's a charm and a, a sense of, of kinship that's very, very easy to form and very hard to lose with John. It's, it's a very, very special thing. I, I will tell you one thing about John now that, that is unique. John was the only person who could actually affect the stock price of Wrigley Spearman, Wrigley's Gum Company. When John decided many years ago to quit smoking, he ran all of the machines in Yorktown out of gum. John took to gum the same way he took to smoking. You chew a few times and then start the next day. Well, he didn't necessarily get rid of it. He'd end up with a mouthful and then get rid of it. But, but John is a person who does things to a reasonable level of excess, everything. John, John, you can characterize John's perception himself of his style of one of always waiting. John views the world as being too slow to ever do things and never doing quite enough, quite soon enough, quite right. So his style is one of constant impatience with everyone. The good way, the way to know that you're in good shape and you're really doing well is when John isn't too upset with you for missing things by too much. It was, you know, kind of fun when we worked on the on the um, 6,000 on the Rios project. John, uh, I knew I was in good shape at some point in time when John stopped telling me all the things I was doing wrong and started focusing on at least a few. <laughs> it was, I, when he told me the whole thing wasn't bad, just a few things needed correcting, I knew we'd made major a major success. So, no, he was in Austin pretty much full time. Um, performing really several major roles. One, he was godfather over the whole project. I, I ran the team, but John was godfather to, to okay, key elements. That, let's start that one again, because I think that's important. Um, On the um, project that produced the uh, Rios Wrist 6000 machine in Austin based on America, John really played several major roles. First, he came down in his capacity um, as my protector to keep me out of trouble. I mean, this was a, a major job that John knew he had accepted and felt was necessary. Second, he played godfather to all of the major technical areas in the architecture of the machine and in a lot of ways in the tools for the machine. 
both of which were necessary to drive as far and as hard as we did. Uh, John basically had free reign to go in and fix things by, by convincing people. And if he couldn't convince people, he'd come down and beat me up and I'd convince them. Uh, giving John free reign sometimes had its drawbacks, but in most cases it was, it was positive. <laughs> there were a few times where John tried to, to make things happen that just couldn't be done that quickly. There was a period of time where John almost went back to Yorktown. He got very angry with me for the most difficult decision I had to make on the RIS 6000 project, which was picking the model for floating point. Uh, as you know, we went IEEE, which is the industry standard for um, the Unix environment. And John spent a great deal of time explaining to me in, in painstaking detail why HEX was better. Now, technically I agreed with everything he said, and I was given the unfortunate choice of having to explain to John that this was one of the few times in my life I was going to make a decision for something I considered technically inferior because it was the only way to win. For a short period of time, I wasn't sure John was going to ever talk to me again. But he really played a role of, of guiding light, godfather, parent, uh, prodder, tormentor. And as I understand it, it was he who chose the name America? Well, the name America dated back to when the project was in uh, Yorktown. When we got down there, as you know, the first name we picked was San Jacinto because we wanted to do something that was a Texas name to bring, make the Texas team feel like they owned it. I and mean, we had to get the sense of ownership very quickly into the team. Uh, we brought down a number of Yorktown people and picked up a, a really terrific development team in Austin. But we had to do some things to, to make it not a research project and make it a real development project. So we picked a name in Texas, San Jacinto, named after the battle in the tower. Um, and the, the name, the American name, rapidly left the uh, lexicon in fact, I think the only remnants of the American name were the picture that I had in my office of John from that party we had for John with the uh, uh, Christopher Columbus poster with John's picture inserted on it that said, first he discovered America, then he discovered greed and all these other, other things from the uh, original poster from the uh, television network. But that was the only reminder of America. You know, one of John's old friends, Bill Davidow, who's now a well-known venture capitalist, but in those days was a hard-working salesman for Intel, reminded me of a story that dates back to when he and John and his wife went off skiing together. John picked up Bill and had this terrific idea. Picked him up in Palo Alto and his wife up in Palo Alto and headed out. John started a sentence in Palo Alto finished it when they arrived in Tahoe. At no time did Bill get a chance to interject that the reservations, in fact, were at Bear. <laughs> then there, were, of course, was the time when John showed up at my house during a uh, dinner that we were having at the house. This was on the, on the lake in New York. And John wanted to spend some time working on a design for a machine that uh, predated the 801 a little bit and proceeded to throw our dinner guest out. I mean, threw him out of the house and instructed Marianne to pack because we were going to go skiing. John felt going skiing was a good place for us to work on this machine. This was around 11 o'clock at night. We packed the skis and packed the clothes and packed Marianne and packed our German Shepherd. Got into the car by around 12. Mary Ann used the dog as a blanket because John and I were actively engaged in a debate and got pretty warm in the car for us. So we opened up the windows, Mary Ann was in back. The dog was her blanket, 120 pounds of German Shepherd. We got up to um, his place up in Sugarbush at around 4.35 and decided to go to sleep. And we went to sleep mid-sentence in the middle of uh, some work we were doing on the memory management for this machine. And much to my wife's consternation, when we woke up in the morning, we picked up in the middle of the same sentence. In fact, she discovered that when we were skiing, we'd work on the design of the machine in the, in the uh, chairlift going up. No, it wasn't a chairlift, it was one of these 
gondolas going up, get up to the top of the mountain, ski down, not discussing the machine, and pick up on the sentence we'd left off at when we got back in line or into the gondola. My wife was very put off by this whole thing. She did not think this was normal behavior for two adult uh, human beings, but over the years she came to recognize this as our normal way of working. Okay, well we'd, well, we'd go up the, we'd go up the uh, gondola working on the machine, get up to the top, tighten our, belt, our, our boot buckles, ski down, couldn't talk then, get back in line, pick up right on the sentence we left off at, work our way back up, and we did that all day long. Now my wife thought this was rather peculiar behavior for two adult men, but over the years she got to understand that's the way John and I worked. It would go and be just as bad when we were in the office. If I had to go to a meeting or John had to go to a meeting, we'd talk until one of us got in an elevator and the door shut. And next time we saw each other, we'd just pick up on that word in the middle of the sentence. And there were, again, people around Yorktown who thought that this was peculiar behavior. The thing that makes for good brainstorming is, number one, being able to come up with a maelstrom that really is a storm. But the thing that's unique when you're working with John is you don't feel any constraints about finding flaws in the things either. And you work at that together. So that although there probably is chaff, when you're working, there's not much pressure not to weed it out very quickly. Usually, when you're working with John, you'll find that, that you'll fix the problems way before other people discover them or throw them out. So. John is, I mean, there are people I knew who give fireworks. John is actually a much calmer person than a lot of the people we worked with. He, he's very committed. He gets very excited, but not to the degree of, of the types of fireworks. I've never seen John, for example, slam a ruler down on, a, on a, um, an overhead projector and break the uh, glass, and yet I have been in rooms where that's happened. I've never seen John throw a real tantrum. I've seen John upset, but John is not as prone to fireworks as a, as a large number of people I know are. I'll tell you a story about John when he decided to buy a car back when he was out here working on ACS. His, his Corvair had really died and he decided to buy a car and he went into a car dealer. Late at night, saw a firebird that he liked. Walked into the dealer, walked up to him and said, I won't buy that one. I said, well, what color would you like it? What options do you want? He said, no, you don't understand. I want to buy that one. And with that, he reached into his pocket and pulled out this stack of IBM paychecks. He never bothered to cash. Well, the dealer was sure this represented a major theft at IBM, so he did the natural thing. He called up IBM security, and they called uh, the guy who at that time uh, ran the lab, got him out, he was home, and I said, we got a guy here. If you had a major theft of checks from IBM, we got a guy here with a large number of paychecks. Well, this is a friend of ours who's since retired from IBM, but he asked all the right questions. His first question was, is he balding? The man said, well, yes. Said, Does he have kind of a southern accent but speak too fast to really be a southerner? He says, yeah. Is he about six foot one, six foot two? Yeah, that's him. Should we hold him? No, take his checks. They're good. And he hung up. And John just started signing and told the guy, tell me when to stop, and just you know, kept signing checks until he paid for the car. <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's that charm, it's that whole different way of looking at life that, that makes it so much fun. The actual beginnings of it um, were that John had <laughs> been up in Tahoe and his, his Corvair had died. Uh, and he left it up there to be fixed, rented a car for three months, Finally got the car back, was really pleased it had been completely redone at great expense. Got Bertram into it and went to show him how good this new car, his, his Corvair was. Got out in the freeway and all of a sudden John's pulling over and Bertram says, why are you, why are you, doing, why are you slowing down, John? And John said, I'm not slowing down, the car died again. And that was what got John into the mood to do this. But it was... Uh, it was only it was only something that could happen to John. <laughs>